Tolkien's own mythology had begun many years earlier in his first and perhaps most important creative work, which would not be published until after his death. The Silmarillion was my was the primary, central work of my father's secondary world. One of the chief things that people know about it, I think, is that it was unfinished. But I think this is, in a way, misleading. Uh, the real point is, is that there were several Silmarillions. When he was a very young man, during the First World War, and in the years immediately following, he wrote a work called The Book of Lost Tales, which the little notebooks that he used still exist, little penny notebooks. And some parts of it, he recorded, were written in the trenches under shell fire. And this was the first Silmarillion, although he didn't then call it that. It's quite unlike his later manner of writing, when he adopted a much more remote, exalted, even manner for his mythology. It's more immediate. It's even funny. Uh, it's very f written in an extraordinarily flowery, consciously archaic manner, which I think is very attractive. But there already, in uh, often in very early undeveloped forms, are the great stories, the great legends, which were an inspiration to him throughout his life. Above all, the, uh, the lay of Beren and Luthien and the tragedy of Turin Turamba. Another Silmarillion was already in existence by about 1930. And that is very different. It's, it's as I say, it's in, in a more remote style and it's, uh, it's more chronicle-like. The important thing is that that was finished. The Book of Lost Tales, you could say, was finished. The 1930 Silmarillion was finished. It's complete. A completely enclosed myth, not presupposing any later ages. And at that stage, the Hobbit had no connection with it. In fact, he said in a letter that he wrote in 1964, he said, by the time The Hobbit appeared in 1937, this, the Silmarillion was in coherent form. The Hobbit was not intended to have anything to do with it. I had the habit, while my children were still young, of inventing and telling orally, sometimes of writing down, children's stories, in inverted commas, for their private amusement. The Hobbit was intended to be one of them. It had no necessary connection with the mythology, by which he means the Silmarillion, but naturally became attracted towards this dominant construction in my mind, causing the tale to become larger and more heroic as it proceeded. Even so, it could really stand quite apart. And so you see, the, uh, the famous names of Middle-earth, such as the Misty Mountains, Mirkwood, the great river of Wilderland. They began with the Hobbit and had no necessary association at all with the mythology as it existed at that time. The Lord of the Rings was, began as the sequel to the Hobbit. But this dominant construction in my mind, as he says, attracted everything into it attracted the Hobbit, and still more, of course, attracted the Lord of the Rings. So the Lord of the Rings becomes, <coughs> in the most complex fashion, both the sequel to the Hobbit and heavily involved with the Silmarillion. The Lord of the Rings, Tolkien's heroic romance, as he called it, with its vast imagined world, was begun in 1937. But it took him 12 years to write, at the same time, he continued with his academic work as Professor of Anglo-Saxon at Oxford, which was so closely related to his creative writing. I think that they were intertwined with each other. What I call the content, as opposed to the practice of his academic work, is one of the primary ingredients in the secondary world. 
many kinds. Anglo-Saxon above all. And of course, the philology. The philology of the primary world relates very, very closely to the languages of the secondary world. Sindarin and Quenya, the languages, the elvish languages of Middle Earth. Uh, they're totally different in the sense in which he meant use the word fantasy they're, they are the languages of the fantasy but they're very hard they're hard bitten they have their own severe phonetics their severe grammatical history which shows I think is important is it shows what the word fantasy means there's nothing crazy or absurd in the idea his fantasy philology is just as, just as strict as the philology of the Germanic languages that he practiced as a, that he expanded as a professor. So I think that his academic, the content of his academic uh, life, as I say, intertwined and was productive, very productive, in his sub-creative, well, it seems to me that he, uh, he poured everything he knew about early literature into the fiction and that uh, one of the great strengths of the fiction has been this sense of an enormous weight of knowledge and accumulated experience and accumulated thought which has been put into it and which cannot be counterfeited, which cannot be faked.